Hi, I'm Mimi Gerges. An Arab diplomat and father reflects on what it means to be a true Muslim and writes personal letters to his teenage son on how not to become a radical. These people who spoke with violence, how do we allow them to actually educate our children and steal our children from us? We must make sure that the line between the traditional approach to Islam and the extremists is thick. Welcome to the Mimi Gerges Show. Ambassador Omar Ghobesh grew up in the United Arab Emirates, the UAE, to an Arab father and Russian mother. He lost his father at the age of six to political violence. Educated in the UK, he's thought a lot about what it means to be a Muslim in the 21st century and how Islam can be interpreted in a way that is peaceful and inclusive. Recognizing the appeal of the jihadist message, he wrote a book called Letters to a Young Muslim. It's a series of letters to his eldest son, on how to navigate the complexities of modern life while staying true to his faith. Ambassador, welcome. Thank you very much. Could you tell us about your father and um, how he was killed? Sure. Uh, my father uh, was the Minister of State of Foreign Affairs um, in the UAE in the early 70s, up until 77. Uh, and uh, the, the tradition in kind of diplomatic political circles is that when a uh, visiting dignitary arrives, you um, uh, send an equal, um, uh, somebody of the same uh, rank to greet him uh, and then uh, to uh, escort him when he leaves. Uh, and so in this case, it was the Syrian foreign minister at the time who was leaving and my father was escorting him. They were roughly the same height. Uh, they were both dressed in suits, uh, which was uncommon for a uh, Gulf Arab at the time. Uh, and um, it seems that the assassin um, mistook my father for the Syrian foreign minister. And it was an assassination, but uh, what makes it doubly tragic is an uh, accidental uh, killing. This was a Palestinian assassin. Yes, it was a Palestinian. Going after the Syrian. Yes, uh, you know, I haven't really uh, been able to, um, I haven't really delved too much into the, the, the reasons behind it, but I understand that the uh, Syrian government at the time had taken some very serious steps against the Palestinian refugees. Um, but, you know, that's for historians to, to understand. What was your religious upbringing like? You know, it was, um, it was a mixture of uh, hands-off uh, from my mother, who's, who would always tell us, you know, you know uh, right from wrong. Uh, and then uh, from the age of 11, uh, it was much more engaged. Uh, I was sent to uh, a summer school where we were uh, taught the Quran, uh, and we were taught to memorize. Um, and, uh, and that's essentially where uh, my understanding of a much stricter and um, uh, ritualistic uh, Islam came from. Uh, and so that, that continued until I was about 14. Uh, I spent a lot of time uh, mixing uh, with uh, fellow Muslims who were, uh, who were very religious and very pious. And, and you know, there was a kind of a communal sense there. Even though we had many friends who were uh, non-Muslim and, and non-Arab, non uh, there was still the sense that you know, we, w we were special in, in some way. Um, I reached, uh, at, at the age of about 15, I, I reached a kind of a, 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 a personal crisis in trying to um, navigate being a Muslim with this exclusive understanding of uh, uh, Islam uh, and uh, having uh, you know my friends uh, uh, friends that I turned my back on uh, and so I, I decided that I would uh, exit the situation and I went to boarding school uh, and then you know, literally every, exiting the country yes you know it was a kind of a, a time out a personal time out and I highly recommend it for many people in the region you've said that you felt like an outsider growing up in the UAE how so well, look, it, not an outsider all the time, um, but there were some critical moments when, for, for example, we talk about Emirati identity, and we still do talk about Emirati identity you know, 30 years uh, later. Um, but at the time when this first came up, uh, we became very conscious of being the only kids with a foreign mother. Uh, and actually, with, with, with time, um, there's a new generation of, of young Gulf Arabs who are uh, half, half Gulf Arab, uh, uh, half foreign, uh, whether from the mother's side or for the f from the father's side. But our, at, at the time when we were kids, um, w there were very, very few of us. Uh, and we didn't speak Arabic the way uh, the, other, uh, the other kids spoke Arabic. They had a very clear sense of identity. They knew exactly how to wear the traditional uh, costume. Uh, they had a sense of pride that we couldn't share in. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there were absolutely amongst kids, there were occasional moments where you would be put, put in your place as, a, as, a, as an outsider. Now, the interesting thing is that outsider mentality has, um, has, has changed and it's become an incredible advantage uh, as the leadership of the country has realized that you know, we need those 
uh, interlocutors who can, or the mediators who can understand how the Emirates can fit into a globalized world. So actually now you find that many Emiratis who are uh, half, half breeds um, perform a function uh, uh, in, in sort of helping the country go forward. So it's interesting. You grew up, though, um, Ambassador, listening to sermons that said that men were superior to women, that Islam is under attack, and that you have to fight back. How did you turn against that teaching? Well, you know, you can hear these things and you can, you can sort of uh, swallow, it, swallow them whole. Or you can hear them and wonder, well, where did this come from and why are we all of a sudden under attack? I'm not under attack. Uh, you know, I look around myself and everybody seems to be doing fairly well. You're right that that's what I heard as a, as a child, but I've continued to hear it in mosques uh, across the region. Now, a change has taken place over the last few years uh, where governments have begun to say, we have handed over the, the, uh, the sermons and the religious sphere to an unregulated mass of self-appointed clerics. We need to bring order into this. And so I'm not the only one who observed that there was a kind of a very negative, uh, destructive, angry, frustrated uh, uh, content to the sermons. So it's wonderful to know that we've got leadership that can say, OK, we can actually get a positive message. I mean, you actually have a choice in these matters. There is no. Um, uh, absolute uh, kind of force that tells us we must be negative in the sermon. So to think of the sermon as a way of communicating with uh, your community, um, you have a choice in being positive or being nev negative. And the, the government has actually come in and said, you know what, we're going to focus on positive ideas. And we're going to focus on, uh, on, on tolerance, <laughs> on acceptance of the other, on uh, you know, even some of the simpler, simpler things like, you know, can you say Merry Christmas to a Christian? Uh, yes, you can, and it shouldn't have been a debate in the first place. Yeah? But you know, the current clerical and theological establishment of Islam are literalist. So how can you say that there's a different interpretation when all the literalists are saying, look, whatever the text says, that's what we do and that's what we believe? There are many, many lines in that text and even they recognize, even the literalists, literalists of the literalists uh, recognize that there are metaphorical understandings. Uh, they recognize that there are certain verses that are no longer applicable. Um, they recognize that the verse itself doesn't uh, throw out a meaning immediately. Uh, and that's why you have the prophetic traditions. And beyond the prophetic tradition, you have the, uh, the um, interpretations and understandings of the prophetic traditions. Uh, there is also the fact that, you know, we all know that the Qur'an is the word of God, and yet the word of God is labeled either Meccan or Medinan, which places it in a historical context. Why are we interested in a historical context if the only thing, thing that matters is the word? So it is literalist, but it is, it is also uh, open to uh, kind of um, a histor historical construction. And so in all of these places, actually, there are openings for slightly different understandings, slightly different perspectives. So. How do you define a true Muslim? I don't define a true Muslim uh, in, in that sense. And in fact, I've got an, I personally have thought very uh, much about this issue of true Islam versus non-true Islam. Uh, and I, I think that it's actually become a bit of an obstacle because we all uh, fight over this target, which is called true Islam. Uh, and and you know, how do we lay claim to it? And once we lay claim to it, uh, how do we then uh, get everybody else to follow us? Um, so I would say that there is a different approach to, to take to this issue. Rather than to talk about true or false Islam, we're thinking of a continuum here, and a continuum that is expressed through our human conduct. Um, so, so somebody asked me, well, you know, the, the, you're suggesting that um, it's the free choice of any individual to come to the Quran and say, this is the way I read things. Well, uh, to an extent, I'd say that that's at least a starting point. The starting point, though, is really to um, uh, to, to, to look at our common humanity and the, and, the, and the basic principles and values of humanity and to see if your reading is in some way uh, uh, um, in conflict with basic humanity. So if, for example, you pick up the Quran and you see it as a license to cut heads off and to go and uh, uh, enslave women and all of a sudden to satisfy your own uh, sexual uh, uh, desires, something is wrong. It's, it's a strange coincidence that you're, 
your uh, violent, aggressive, animalistic, criminal desires are satisfied by this religion. But I guess it depends on how you define human values. Absolutely. Because uh, I think they're defining them differently. Well, I don't think that they are defining them. Uh, I don't think they are talking about human values. And I think this is also another um, issue that the clerics need to clarify. There are a group of clerics who say, actually, it is these basic human values that existed to a certain extent uh, in, in inchoate form before Islam. Uh, and one of the ways in which we know that is the prophetic tradition that says um, that, that the prophet uh, s said, I have come uh, to perfect your morals. If he, has come to he, if he had come to perfect our morals, that essentially means there were a set of morals that we could understand and tap into. Um, there was a sense of justice and injustice even before the revelation of the Quran. And that sense of justice and injustice was given greater expression through the Quran. So um, I, I think that, that's important. Um, there are others, uh, again, the literalists, who say that there is no position before the, the text. Uh, and that you can actually, they believe that you can come to the text and find all of the values, uh, uh, even if they seem irrational or illogical, that those values are there in the Quran. Uh, and, and I would say that that's an impossible position to take because we are thrown into the world, we are born into the world, uh, and we come with a position already before we, we reach the text. Uh, let me go back to this narrative that is really gaining traction in the Muslim world, which is that Islam is under attack by the West, by non-Muslims. And Western political leaders, in order to counter that narrative, they'll say things like, um, this violence has nothing to do with Islam. Um, yes. They might uh, not want to use the term Islamic terrorism. Mm -hmm. Do you find that helpful? Is, is that the way they should be going? Well, it, it is one way, uh, um, and, and, and that kind of falls in line with a certain kind of political correctness. And I, I can understand uh, in, in terms of the, the local dynamics of any particular Western political system, you don't, you don't want to uh, cross those lines. Within our context in the Middle East, uh, we recognize uh, extremism, and we recognize it as religious extremism, Islamic extremism, and extremism that is related very much to, uh, to us. Uh, and in some cases, you know, the debates that have taken place in the Gulf and, and the, the wider Arab region, uh, people have asked, what is it that we have given birth to? What, it is, what is it that we have allowed to, uh, to, to take place here? Uh, how is it that we allowed um, these, these people who, who spoke violently, who spoke with violence, how did we allow them to actually educate our children and steal our children from us? So here I think we, we need to be... Um, bold in saying that absolutely we wish this wasn't part of our religion. We wish that this wasn't claimed as a, as a part of our, uh, our, our faith. However, there are certain reasons why this interpretation has uh, uh, arisen. And we need, to be, uh, we need to be intelligent and analytical about how it is that we are now going to talk about our faith going forward. Um, the, we, mustn't, we must make sure that the line between uh, the traditional uh, kind of or, or uh, traditional or even progressive uh, approach to Islam is thick between that and the extremists, because currently the line is not that that th uh, that, that that well uh, defined. Why does the phrase "Islam is a religion of peace" make you uncomfortable? Well, I, I, it it only makes me uncomfortable because uh, clearly we are in conflict and we are in turmoil, and so it is not obvious. Um, that uh, it is a religion of peace. We wish it to be a religion of peace. Uh, but, but you know, when we say it is a religion of peace, um, uh, the, the immediate uh, idea that comes to mind is, well, why are we talking about religion of peace? There must be something behind that. Uh, so is there some time when it's a religion of war? Um, why are we thinking in that kind of binary, uh, war and peace? So uh, I think we need to be, uh, you see, again, I'm not being doctrinal about this. I'm not giving any prescriptions. But I think we need to have an open conversation, a much more, uh, uh, a much more engaged discussion about what it means to be at, at peace. Are we at peace with the world, or are we at peace with ourselves? And I wonder whether we are actually at peace with ourselves. The Muslim Brotherhood has a slogan that says, Islam is the solution. Yes. The solution to what? Uh, to be honest, um, um, uh, that's a, it's a fantastic political slogan which allows you to put anything as the problem uh, and therefore Islam is the solution. So they say to the public, you don't have the intelligence to really understand how 
society, how the economy, how policy, how corruption, how justice work. All you need to know is that we will put Islam forward and everything will be okay. And For there's one, also no um, taking ownership of your own problems, right? And, and trying to solve them yourselves. I think that that's part of it because if you say that Islam is the solution or is the answer, um, and, and you're, you're basing this on some kind of mystical conception of uh, a causation, that if you are pious enough, then God will solve the problem for you. Um, if the problem is not solved, well, then clearly you weren't pious enough, and we've got to go back to square one, make sure that you know, we separate men from women, more people go to the mosque, and so on. Um, but there is an activist element within uh, our religious tradition as well, which says you, know, you have to change yourself to get, to get things happening. Uh, you, have to, you have to actually take action. Yeah? Uh, and I think you know, th th that, again, is a choice. You know, the Islamists have a very attractive package, right? Yes. They offer people black and white solutions. Uh, there's a feeling of superiority. Uh, there might be a lack of personal responsibility that we just talked about. Um, it's always somebody else's fault, you know, in, in that narrative. What you're offering is kind of the opposite, right? It's not that attractive. <laughs> I'm not so sure. It's not because you actually have to work and you have to feel like, you know, no, I have to solve my own problems. No, it's not that the Jews messed everything up or the, it's colonialism that's the problem. And if America hadn't have done this, then we would have been fine. Yeah, uh, I'm, I know a whole bunch of people who uh, find work fun. Uh, and, uh, you know, but I, I've also met people who um, at the age of 20 have been looking forward to um, the, the uh, uh, privileges that they will get at retirement at 45. Uh, and so, yeah, I think this is, um, I think we need to remind people that this is their only life. This is the one that they're going to live. And that, uh, and we also need to pro provide them with the opportunity to live a life, uh, to actually uh, begin to see that uh, merit uh, is, is uh, credited, right? So, you know, if you make the effort that there will be some kind of um, uh, positive r r result from that. So I think, I think that's And that there's a lot of gray area. Ah, gray is, is the color, no? <laughs> <laughs> but in Islam, in hardline Islam, let me say, it's haram, forbidden, or it's halal, it's permitted. That's it. But yes, absolutely. And I think this is part of the problem as well, is that uh, the, our moral lives are not so clear cut. Uh, and I think that that's where we need to, we need to be clear um, with ourselves that if somebody promises you a black and white answer, then something is wrong. You know, those, they, they don't exist. There is no black and white in life. But I can see you getting a lot of resistance from Islamist hardliners, the radicals, who um, maybe are not even calling you a real Muslim because of your beliefs. I, I haven't received any kind of uh, uh, negative feedback uh, so far. Uh, there have been a couple of people who have made the point, th uh, and for, for example, there was one uh, young man who uh, wasn't interested in the set of arguments in, in, in the book, and he wasn't interested in reading it. Uh, and I, I recognize uh, where he's coming from. And one of the arguments I put in the book is that before we condemn foreign arguments, foreign ideas, or, or ideas that don't make, uh, that, that um, come with uh, uh, kind of a, a label, uh, is that we need to hear them. The only way you're going to judge an argument is by listening to it. And I think this is an area in which we need to speak to our clerics and, and pull them out, essentially, of this kind of narrow uh, field that they, they tend, which says all knowledge, all valid knowledge, if you can say that, is Islamic. And beyond that, there, it's all illegitimate. And I, you know, I think that we need to be uh, clear that there are so many contradictions in that position. Um, a young man uh, criticized me recently on, online on Facebook and, and said that, um, you know, you speak about the individual Muslim. Uh, you, why are you introducing this foreign concept into uh, Islam? Uh, and I noted that he was writing in the English language, which is foreign to Islam, if you go back to the seventh century. He was writing uh, as an individual, and he was on, uh, uh, social, uh, media. on social media, which is a Western uh, 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 in invention. 
So you know, these basic contradictions, if we are to be true to in the sense that these people would like us to be true, then we must return to a 7th century state, which means that we need to get rid of all of the um, uh, wonderful things that we have received from Western, Western societies. We should give up you know, uh, hydrocarbons as a, as, a, as a means of sort of uh, uh, satisfying ourselves. And we should tend uh, to, to our, our, our small flock. We should return to a, a very primitive kind of economy. Are we willing to do that? No, I don't think so. Um, but are we willing to face the contradictions? Again, that's something that I think has to come out in the end. Why do I make these statements? It's because I believe that Islam has an incredible wealth of resources and tools and ideas and, 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 and a history to work with in order to not to reinterpret Islam, not to reform Islam, but to, to provide clarity to Muslims in the 21st century. And so that's why I'm, I'm very much an optimist. Of course people will disagree, and of course people will shut their eyes and close, and close their ears, but uh, you know. You're I, an I, optimist even though it doesn't seem like your views are really gaining traction. It's the other guys that are. No, it, it's the more muscular, violent Islam. I think you can be muscular and open-minded as well about Islam. I think that's also very important, which is that I do believe that there is a large group of, of Muslims who put themselves in a position where they think it's also black and white. Uh, and so this is something that we don't talk about, but I've, I've spoken to clerics about it. Uh, the issue of um, Muslims leaving Islam today which should be very, very worrying for, uh, for the Muslim community. Uh, and, it's, and I'd say that it's partly because they're presented with the black and white uh, of Islam when in fact life is not black and white, life is a whole series of interesting compromises uh, and, uh, and, and approaches. So. so Ambassador, how can ISIS be defeated? Well, I think th there are two different aspects to this. I mean, there is the military security aspect, uh, which I think is being conducted with the help of a tremendous number of different countries. I never thought that that was really um, the a critical uh, approach. I think ISIS is really more a state of mind. Uh, it's an approach to the world. Uh, and uh, I believe that it is deeply unhealthy and it is deeply disrespectful of the human values that I see embodied in Islam. Um, but we need to, if you want to think about it as lobbying, we as Muslims need to lobby within our own community for a certain perspective. Um, and, and we also need to remember that every time somebody tells you, no, this is the right approach, that actually that's a choice. They're making a choice for you. And I want to, I want to return us to, a, or rather I want to pull us towards a situation where we realize that every single individual Muslim is making a choice. Uh, and that choice is uh, forced upon them uh, because we no longer live in 19th century or 18th century or 10th century villages. We are faced with the entire spectrum of Islamic movements today. I have a question for converts to Islam. Why do you choose Sunni Islam? Why do you choose Shia Islam? Why are you a Sufi? Uh, and m the response is actually, well, you know, that appealed to me. Uh, so, so they're taking a religion and saying, well, this is a marketplace of uh, religious experiences. Now, is that the way I should look at my own religion? Is it a marketplace of experiences? Or is it the only thing that I can really tap into here and, and hold on to and feel that, that is truly valuable and, and real is humanity. And it is the humanity that comes through. What do you think of uh, blasphemy laws? Uh, you know, the, this is a very interesting question. I'm glad you asked me. I think that they are, I think they're deeply unhelpful. Uh, and I, uh, I, I mean, that's putting it lightly. It <laughs> is mean, putting it lightly. There are people in jail because somebody accused them yes. of being yes, I know. disrespectful of Islam's prophet. Well, I think we have an issue with the whole uh, concept of respect. Uh, for example, um, I, I, I just assume uh, um, artificial intelligence decides one day I'm going to poke fun at the Muslims, uh, uh, say in 50 years' time. And uh, Artificial intelligence comes along and says, I'm going to put out on every single person's mobile phone a, com a, a little cartoon of the prophet making fun of him. Who do you blame there? Who do you attack? Who do you shout at? These things are no longer, I mean, th this can be done on such a scale that the world can come to a halt. Uh, but the this is theoretical. I mean, can't but we just, uh, I mean, can you say flat out that all blasphemy law should be abolished and that it is contrary to human values? What I can say is that it is really, uh, it, 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 would ha it has a negative effect on the way in which we will, will take our, 
uh, lives forward. If, if uh, as in some countries, they've now proposed that not only should uh, the prophet be untouchable, but uh, his, his followers, uh, his wider group of followers, anything related to it. Well, we'll never have a serious discussion about Islam and the way in which we are. So the blasphemy laws empower uh, the very, very strict traditionalist. Uh, and it's, it's handing over power to people that we don't necessarily uh, want to hand over Does power Does the to. UAE have blasphemy, blasphemy laws? I have to be honest, I don't know, which <laughs> means that we probably don't. <laughs> What's your vision? What's your dream for the Muslim world? Well, it, it's partly related to the, to the Arab world as well, um, uh, because there's a tremendous overlap. Uh, uh, Islam is a very, very much an Arab religion, and it's a, uh, the, the language of Islam is, is Arabic. Um, the culture of the Prophet is essentially uh, uh, Arab. Uh, and so I, I would hope that, you know, um, that we have, instead of feeling that we're in some kind of repeated cycle of, uh, of, of uh, impotent striving for some kind of power, uh, and then failure and starting up again, which I see uh, happening. Uh, I, I want to see young people, and particularly young people, um, taking more control over their own lives and not feeling that taking control over their own lives is some kind of immoral act. Uh, for them to feel that actually, you know, even if I'm not 100% perfect ethically today, yeah, if, I'm, if I'm working towards a better understanding uh, of, of, of being ethical, then maybe, maybe that's okay, yeah? Um, and so what I want is not instantaneous moral perfection, but an, a striving towards working with people to make this, the, 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 uh, the Arab and the Islamic world a better place, and raising the level, level of literacy in the Muslim world. <laughs> Ambassador, thanks so much for being on the program. Thank you very much. This has been the Mimi Gargas Show. You can see all of our programs on WHUT.org and YouTube. Connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, and leave me your comments. Thanks for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next time.